Hello, good morning and welcome to this free introductory class about string herbs. I'm Vivian Campbell, I'm a qualified herbalist. I qualified in 2003 and um, my training was very much geared towards running a clinic, um, which I still do very part time now actually in, in uh, County Clare in, in Ireland, although I did it full time for years. Um, but my my work really expanded to to encompass all sorts of different ways of working with plants that are medicinal, edible, and can be used in natural cosmetic making. And really, about um, twelve years ago, I really started to focus more in depth on what grew on my doorstep and to. Um, start to use the the native plants that were growing prolifically, um, but were very much overlooked. And um, I, because I was so young when I qualified, I was only 24. I didn't have my own house or my own garden, which the thing back then was to be a proper herbalist, you were supposed to be much older than I was. <laughs> and also you were supposed to have your own house and your herb garden that you cultivated medicinal herbs in. And um, so I didn't fit that, um, that uh, profile. And um, I lived in shared houses and apartments, including when I studied herbal medicine um, in the city in the UK. And I always, found a way to connect to local plants that way and herbal herbs as foods and medicines that way and just use what was growing. So um, none of that's changed. I don't really cultivate anything. Still, I prefer plants that can look after themselves and do their own thing. And there's a huge amount of those. So instead of using, instead of um, buying calendula and, and cultivating that in my garden, and calendula is a wonderful medicinal herb which um, I'm sure loads of you will have used calendula cream or ointment or be growing calendula in your garden. It's a gorgeous cheerful bright orange yellow um, daisy family flower um, but it's native to the Mediterranean and um, while it's easy to grow here in, in Ireland or if you're in the UK it's easy to grow in either country and very beneficial to grow especially in organic gardening it's um it's uh, not native and our you know we have wonderful native alternatives growing here so i started to look at using daisies i know we've done at least one of these classes over the last um four or five weeks or so focusing on on daisy i i have some daisy extracts behind me here which we might talk about later um but i started to look at daisies self heal cleavers, um, silverweeds, that's another one I love. Um, red clover is widely used in herbal medicine and when you go on a training course you do learn about it but only in quite a narrow way and there's a huge scope for using red clover as well um, as a wild food and also in natural cosmetic making and it's just totally overlooked that way so um, there, there's just huge potential for using things on your doorstep that are pretty much foolproof to recognize, you know, and um, I'm not talking about anything difficult here when, uh, particularly when I teach by video, when I teach in person, it's, it's different and we can see things in more detail, we can smell them, there's, there's, there are lots of characteristics that you'll experience in real life with the plant that it's not possible to get across um, with a camera. Um, but for really basic things like dandelion, cleavers, daisy, self heal, plantain, you know, there's at least 10 um, that are really easy to recognize that it's, um, well, there's a lot more than 10 actually, there's probably about 40 that are really easy to recognize. Um, that you, you know, as long as you pay just a basic bit of attention and have some common sense, then um, you're not going to muddle up with something else. And um, like using electricity, it's uh, dangerous if you don't have any guidelines and they're left off on your own. But once you learn a few basic, basic uh, rules to stick to, then everything's hunky dory. So, um, 
let's crack on. So thanks everybody for joining in. We have got so many people on here today and uh, loads more will be watching back on the video recording. So hello to various people from around Ireland um, and uh, the UK. It seems to be where most people are on from this morning. We have had people on from the States and Canada and Egypt and uh, various other places as well actually, but we'll crack on. So today we're going to focus on, um, a, I've, I've tried to narrow it down now <laughs> to two herbs in, in a class. So today we're going to look in a bit more detail at two plants that are common, that are in season just now. So sorrel, which is a really nice edible plant, and also cleavers, which is um, used as a herbal medicine and uh, various other things. And um, they're very easy to recognise again when you know how. So if you have questions or comments, then do please pop them in the chat bar. Um, is anybody making, but let's start with the sorrel, I think. Is anybody making anything with sorrel? Have you ever used it? it, um, it is it a name that's familiar to you? There are several different types. Well, there are at least three sorrels that I know of anyway. Um, common sorrel, which is the one that we'll look at today, but there's also sheep sorrel and um, um, wood, wood sorrel, which is a lovely one. Wood sorrel looks a bit like a, a, a four-leaf clover. You have some in your front garden. Great, yeah, yeah. So um, sorrel, you, I'll, I'll show you some sorrel first of all. Now this is, first, this is just live broadcast software, okay? So how good your connection is will depend on what your Wi-Fi um, connection is. So the sound and video quality will um, vary depending on that. Um, I'm only going to be showing, holding up plants to show you and showing extracts here. Um, but in the video course, everything is filmed in HD broadcast quality and it's pre-recorded. So there, it's super sharp video, you know, so um, don't uh, worry about that. It's, it's crystal clear for ID. Um, children eat the wood sorrel. Yeah, wood sorrel is, um, so sorrel is a very lemony tasting plant. Um, this is, um, as a sorrel leaf, you may or may not recognise it, which the slugs have been chomping in my garden. I, this is why I, one of the many reasons I don't cultivate things. I'm too busy. Wild medicinal and edible plants grow around, grow anyway, so you know you can just go and help yourself if you don't have any work to do. And the third reason is the uber slugs that I have in the garden where I live at the moment, so um, they just uh, drove me to despair. But um, what you'll see with sorrel is, um, and, and again, don't worry if you can't pick this up on the live broadcast software because it's really clear in the identification photos and videos. But sorrel has this um, sort of, uh, the leaf tends to come to a bit of a rounded tip. But do you see the points at the base of the leaf? If I put my thumb behind that, do you see it comes to a point? And it comes to a point there. That's really distinctive with sorrel. Um, I'll show you another one and you'll see the points at the base of the leaf. Here we've got a baby sorrel. This one is so young that the slugs haven't got it. And again, the points at the base of the leaf. And here we've got, a, I was going to say moth-eaten, but no, a slightly older sorrel leaf, bigger one. And again, uh, the slugs have been chomping their way through that. And again, the points at the base of the leaf. So that's the most important identification feature for sorrel is that the base of the leaf is pointed. Um, it's a really um, easy plant to identify and when you Mm. When you eat it, it tastes really, really lemony. Um, so the reason I've gone to so much hassle to show you these points at the base of the leaf is just, it's actually less of an issue just now because the growth of the plants has come on already, but um, sorrel is very easy to identify. But in spring, when the leaves are really young, um, in early spring, that's really the most um, 
it's the time of year where people, when they're new to foraging, would be most likely to make a mistake with identification because when plants are just starting to grow, um, young leaves of, of plants that look very different when they've, when they've grown up and they're flowering, the young leaves can actually look really similar. So um, a very scary example um, is um, young comfrey leaves. So comfrey um, is actually can be cooked like a, a vegetable, used in small amounts, but it can be cooked that way. And it's used as a herbal medicine. Um, so comfrey is a, a, a usually quite a safe plant to work with, but young comfrey leaves actually look alarmingly like young foxglove leaves. And if you muddle those up, then you generally die or go into a coma. <laughs> so because foxglove is um, <clears throat> poisonous and will stop the heart um, from beating, hence people dying. Um, so it's, um, whereas comfrey and foxglove look completely different when they've grown up. So just to do be, um, you're coming into a time now as we get into May and June, where it's much safer to start to learn this stuff because plants are flowering or they've got taller. Um, really the time of year where people tend to make mistakes if, they, if they're new to this and they're, they're not learning from a teacher, they're not learning from a, a book, they're, they've just decided to go out and try it themselves, is in spring when the leaves are young because so many young leaves can look very similar to um, things that are poisonous. So with sorrel, um, the, the one it can be muddled up with is a poisonous plant called, <laughs> it does have a funny name, called Lords and Ladies. Now I have this growing in my garden, um, but it's, I, I nearly picked some of it for you just now, but it's so big and different now, I think there's no point in me showing you it because the comparison isn't there. But Lords and Ladies is a poisonous plant and it's just when the leaves are really, really young, usually in, in March and April, that they can look similar. Um, but the Lords and Ladies don't have this point at the base. The base of the leaf is rounded, whereas it doesn't matter what size or state, age or young uh, sorrel leaf I showed you, they all come to a point at the base. Uh, all of them, they all have these pointed tips. The other, the other way to avoid lords and ladies is, uh, I, and uh, distinguish between sorrow and lords and ladies is, lords and ladies usually grows in the shade. So it's underneath the hedgerow, it's underneath trees. And um, sometimes I've seen it growing out in the full sunlight where the machines have just been along and cut back the hedgerow, but it will die back from there because it, it, it usually grows in the shade. So where a sorrel will grow in the shade, but it will also grow out in full sunlight. So if you're out in, in your garden or a field and it's in full sunlight and there aren't any trees or um, shade covering them, then that is a really good indication that you've got sorrel and not lords and ladies. Lords and ladies um, is very poisonous, but people rarely um, uh, have enough to do damage to themselves because it tastes, I am reliably informed, um, by people who have eaten it by accident. It tastes, it, it causes a huge burning sensation in the mouth. Uh, like it's on fire and it tastes that the other description is like cut glass. So it's not something that you're going to muddle up with this lovely lemony, juicy flavour, you know? So um, don't, uh, don't worry about that. Mm. And they look completely different once they start to grow. So sorrel doesn't change from these shapes that I've shown you. Um, and you'll still find it growing fresh in the autumn as well. Um, sorrel just keeps growing and growing. It's one of those ones where if you cut the grass, um, you'll, you'll, get, you'll keep getting more and more crops of it. So it's a, it's a great thing to work with once you're, you're certain that you've been able to identify it properly. Um, Lords and Ladies produces us, it, the leaves get enormous, they go very dark green, they're a completely different shape. It gets a big spike of a flower which turns into um, the, uh, a big um, fruit which is uh, green when it's unripened and a bright orangey red colour when 
um, it's ripe and, and it's, it's the classic thing that parents point out and say to their children, don't have that, it's poisonous. You know, it's a classic poisonous plant. It's just in the early spring where the two things can look a bit um, similar if you're not expecting it. So don't worry. Anyway, has anybody used sorrel for anything? Ziva was saying her children eat it. Yeah. Yeah, what's the difference between lords and ladies? Oh yeah, I'm only just reading your question. Yeah, uh -huh. so that's the main difference, yep. It's, it's just, um, so they grow in different habitats and um, it's the point at the base. Has anybody made anything with sorrel? So it used to be, um, it's fallen out of use in herbal medicine. It was used as traditional remedies at some stage, but I don't know how safe it was really. Um, it's um, that lovely lemony flavour works really well as a wild food. And the simplest thing you can do is get the leaves and chop them finely and mix it through um, a salad. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice thing. It's so lemony, you only need a few leaves. You don't need to sit down to a big basket full of them. Just little amounts uh, is a really nice way to work with it. Um, because it's so lemony as well, it can be made into a really nice sauce um, to, as an accompaniment for a dinner. So for pasta with fish or you know, just a lovely side portion because it's so bright and fresh and lemony tasting. And all you do is pop it in the pan with a little bit of water and wilt it. It only takes a couple of minutes and you beat it then and you can add in some oil or butter and some salt and pepper and it's absolutely delicious. Just munching it out on walks, very refreshing. Yeah, uh, it says Susie. Yeah, absolutely. And Maria says, I'm not familiar with sorrel. What kind of flower does it have? It, you wouldn't notice the flower on it, um, Maria. It's, um, it's, it's a tiny, tiny little pink flower. It's, it's in the same family as the dock, as in the dock leaf that you rub onto um, a nettle sting and um, it has a similar spike with similar tiny tiny little flowers so I didn't bother bringing that in because it's so small people don't usually notice it you know the same you know people don't usually notice dock flowers you know um, so the distinctive thing is the shape of the leaves and the lemony flavor it it probably will be there in your in your lawn it's just it's like self heal um, and um, if you unless you slow down and pay attention to your lawn and stop cutting the grass for a little while then you won't see it if you're if you're mowing the grass then you won't see all sorts of herbs i can pick them out for people because i recognize them when they're tiny and when the leaves are small and i can say oh you've got clover and daisies and plantain and selfiel and uh, silverweed and sorrel and all these other things but if you leave the grass to grow higher then um, it's much more obvious then that you have these different plants um, have a have a look at it if you're um, if you're not sure. I'll, I'll show you it in the videos as well in in the course, and you'll get a better idea of how it grows. Then it's great in omelets or soups. Yes, it is. It's that's a great um, um, you know a little bit of the. I think we talked about this last week with the dandelion. A little bit of um, I'm kind of done so many of these. I'm getting a bit confused, but. Um, uh, finely chopping some wild edible leaves and just adding them through stir fries or through omelettes or through scrambled eggs is a really good way to have them. Um, just with the soup, just very small amounts of sorrel. So um, how high does it grow higher than a dandelion? Um, no, not usually. Um, it would, it, it, it's um, usually around that height, yeah. Um, does it have different properties to wood sorrel? No, it's very similar. Um, so the lemony flavour, you're welcome. The lemony flavour comes from the oxalic acid. Um, and oxalic acid is present in spinach and in rhubarb. And it's something, when we use foods with that, we have to stick to having moderate amounts of it because it can just be too strong. Um, and um, if people have got underlying health conditions, it, it can really aggravate arthritis and gout. 
So if that's you, then you tend to, you're better to stay away from foods, whether they're cultivated ones like spinach uh, and rhubarb or wild ones like sorrel, you're better not to consume those in your diet because it can irritate um, those conditions. Um, also with sorrel, wild foods are much stronger and much more, uh, much more concentrated than cultivated ones. Um, a great example of that is lettuce, you know, if you go into the supermarket and get your green lettuce or your iceberg lettuce, then they're very bland um, they, they all started as from our wild varieties years ago, but you know, all these other ones have been popped up and select selectively bred um, and until we get to the stuff that fills our shops and they've just got blander and blander and blander so that they um, because you know it's expected that uh, milder flavors appeal to more people's palates. Um, whereas, so when you get to our supermarket lettuce, it doesn't have much flavor and it definitely doesn't have any medicinal properties. Whereas if you take it back to its ancestor, the wild lettuce, it's got strong flavor and it's also very strongly sedative. So um, it's a really good example of the difference between how um, bland uh, and less concentrated conventionally cultivated uh, uh, um, varieties that have become our conventionally cultivated foods are compared to their original wild ancestors. So um, that's, uh, I don't know if any of you remember with um, Beatrix Potter books, um, I think it's the tale is it Benjamin Bunny, the tale of Benjamin Bunny, and they sneak into um, Farmer McGregor's garden and the bunnies gorge on the lettuces and eat so many that they all fall asleep because it's strongly soporific. And so the farmer catches them, you know, so that's the source of the trouble in that is that it used to be called lettuce opium. It's not an opiate, but it used to be referred to that way because it was so sleep inducing. So um, to come back to the, the sorrel, um, just use it in moderate amounts if you're going to use it as a wild food because it is a very strong uh, strong one and if people have got underlying kidney problems or liver problems then I would just recommend that you stay away from using it other than very occasionally because uh, and in very small amounts because it, it particularly if the kidneys aren't functioning properly then they can't process the chemicals that are that are in there there was a tragic case of someone with some a uh, very serious kidney condition who made sorrel soup and that was the last thing he ate because it was too much for him and his kidneys gave out. I mean that doesn't happen in a healthy person but um, kidney disease is very serious so um, <clears throat> so it was just too much for his uh, body to process. Um, but um, just in small amounts it's lovely so a few leaves chopped through salad, a few leaves through the stir fry, the portions of that sorrel sauce, it's really really nice, it's got such a distinctive lemony flavour, it's beautiful and um, the wood sorrel actually, um, they used to extract um, oh, what was it called, so, yes the, there was an old fashioned thing that the chemists made um, called salt of lemons and it didn't come from citrus fruits it came from wood sorrel so people used to actually use it as a substitute for citrus fruits and they would they would make um, lemonade without the lemons and it was uh, it was made with this extract salt of lemons that they would be able to buy and um, uh, and that originally was extracted from the wood sorrel. So it is, it's really vibrant, refreshing, lemony flavor. The other thing it's great to, sorry, I can see there are questions coming in. Um, somebody said, so definitely not good for hemochromatosis. No, it shouldn't. Um, hemochromatosis is too much iron. Um, so um, it will just depend on the iron content of sorrel. It doesn't have anything to do with the oxalic acid. Um, so, um, uh, what was I going to say? But, oh yeah, pesto. It makes a beautiful pesto. Um, I make it with hazelnuts. It's lovely, and but you could use other nuts. Um, it does take time to 
to make it um, because it takes time to pick the, the enough tender young sorrel leaves to get a good quality pesto, but it's lovely. It's really nice. Um, it doesn't need um, basil or anything in it. You just whiz up the sorrel leaves with the um, uh, nuts uh, and uh, oil and it's, uh, oh, it's delicious. Yeah, sorrel pesto is lovely. And it's really nice, again, because it's available for so much of the year. You can usually harvest fresh sorrel for at least six months of the year, usually from late March right through till the end of September. Um, as the winters have got milder, you can just keep looking for it. And as I said, it just keeps growing back. So um, there's really only a few months in the winter where we're not able to find that one. Um, I was going to say something. Oh yeah, just don't juice it. That was the other example. So um, I know that juicing is really popular and um, really trendy. Um, and um, it's, it's fine if you're using cultivated foods. But again, with wild foods and, and medicinal herbs, just because something is edible um, or you can make herbal teas from it or whatever. It doesn't mean that it's suitable and safe for juicing um, because juices are, people tend to make them in huge amounts. So they tend to, you know, they're not taking a spoonful, they're taking a big, uh, they're taking great big glasses off or drinking pints off. And uh, they're made from, uh, you know, fruit and veg that they're buying from the supermarket. So they're quite bland. Um, and um, if you start taking wild um, herbs in that quantity, you'll start to get reactions. It's far too strong. Um, herbs were juiced. Um, some of them have got a history of being juiced, but it, but they were very. The dosages were given. They were first of all, it wasn't done just for general health and wellness, like it's advocated with um, fruit and vegetables that are cultivated. Um, juices were made and usually given for where there were very serious um, medical conditions. And um, they weren't the super duper concentrated juices that we can make nowadays with all these um, mechanical extraction machines. They were, they, were, they were pounded and pressed out and squeezed through muslin. So it was a smaller amount of juice that you were making anyway. Um, and it was teaspoon dosages that were given, so not, you know, pint glasses of them. So um, I'll come on to this with the cleavers as well, because it's a really good example of it. But um, th there are a few safe herbs that, um, you know, you can usually take in enormous quantities. And cleavers is a really good example of that. Um, the only time really I've seen people seen people have reactions to cleavers is when they're juicing it and, and drinking these great big tumblers of them. And it's such a safe herb. Um, we use it in huge amounts um, compared to other medicinal herbs, and and um, we usually use it with children. It's it's very safe, but people can just completely overdo things. Um, so just be aware of that. So sorrel isn't one that I would that, that I recommend people juice every day. It's just far too strong. It's far too concentrated, you know, uh, and, and absolutely the same with cleavers. I'm seeing I, 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 try, I just have to log off. <laughs> I have to not look at those wild food recipe groups because um, I, I see people making stuff all the time that I know isn't safe. <laughs> Basically, and I've, and I've learned that um, uh, not to, uh, people rarely thank you for your help or input when you point that out to them um, in those groups for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why they're so, they can be very competitive and nasty to each other in them for some reason. I don't know why, but there we go. Um, there's something about social media that makes, um, it seems to bypass people's brains and hearts, I find, <laughs> a lot of the time anyway. <laughs> Too much of anything isn't great, everything in moderation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, but just to be cautious about the sorrel because that is a strong one, but it's absolutely um, delicious, yeah. Um, is that okay for everyone about sorrel? Has, has anybody had it in salad or, or anything? It's really lovely, it's such a, it's actually, um, it's quite, it, although it's not bulky, it's quite juicy, you know, so it's not just that you get the fresh lemony taste, it's that it's actually, um, 
it's refreshing as in I find it very hydrating actually when um when I eat it so if you're out on a walk I mean if you're out on a walk ideally if you're eating wild herbs the same as if you're eating something that you've bought from the shop you want to wash it first before you eat it so um, my tendency is to bring a bottle of water with me to wash the, the wild herbs before I nibble them rather than to drink it. But it's very succulent tasting, you know, it's very refreshing. So um, I do recommend that you have it. Um, is that all right? Any questions about it? You okay now? I'm going to have a slurp of tea to allow someone to type. And excuse me, um, <coughs> itching my nose, but I went out to pick the herbs. Uh, and I picked it uh, for my tea and for the class and uh, the plantain is flowering and I was picking the plantain leaves and talk about another plant with tiny flowers that you don't usually notice but um, whatever way I moved the, 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 the flowers shook and the pollen went right up my nose so I, I could just feel that <laughs> I feel like I've got plantain flowers stuck in my nose <laughs> which is a new hazard I've never experienced that before. Mm. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Okay. Um, sorry, right, I'll go back through the questions. Some of those, are, somebody asked, Bree, do you ask something? Okay. You mentioned comfrey. Did you say I can cook it like cabbage? Uh, okay, so comfrey, um, it is edible and um, it was very popular sort of with macrobiotic diets and, um, and in vegan diets at one stage as well because of its nutritional profile. It's not one that I recommend that you use much as a food because actually it's very concentrated as well and it is one that people can overdo it with especially again if there if there are liver problems um but yeah it is possible um to cook it as a vegetable but it's it's one to be cautious with so um it contains um perilazolin alkaloids which um can if you take it regularly in in uh, quite a strong dose they build up in the liver and they can cause liver damage it's not going to happen from a, a, a moderate amount or or taking it occasionally we're just talking about where people have taken extreme amounts of it and where people are on very restricted diets they do tend to eat the same foods regularly and that's the thing where um that kind of issue can arise so um a sort of vegan macrobiotic diets that that kept coming back to using comfrey would be the sort of thing where that might be an issue um it's much better as a, a used as a herbal medicine rather than a food is that okay um there are other things that are much easier to and safer to cook like a vegetable like um the the nettles you know obviously the nettles can be cooked like um uh, cabbage um there's there's a lot more stuff like that really yeah um i infuse comfrey leaves in oil and yeah you make infused oil so michelle says i infuse comfrey leaves in oil and then when ready to use i've got comfrey oil if i've got uh, to make a balm for joints and muscles yeah so for aches and pains and strains comfrey is comfrey is a brilliant herbal medicine herbal remedy so i think it's much better used that way rather than as a vegetable substitute um, but it's extremely rich in nutrients and um, that's why it's such a good fertilizer and is a really good feed for especially growing things that need a lot of feed like potatoes and tomatoes so it's it's um common actually just to put comfrey leaves in the in the soil in the bed and just put the plant the potatoes straight in them and then put the soil on top you know it can be as simple as that you don't need to make comfrey fertilizer or anything it's um an invaluable um it's an essential one for an organic veggie garden this comfrey yeah yeah um, would you only use comfrey leaves or the flowers as well? Um, as a herbal medicine, it's usually the leaves and or the root that's used of comfrey. Haven't ever come across the flowers being used for anything. Um, and I encourage you to leave comfrey flowering because the flowers are 
um, uh, have that lovely shape that bees like to crawl into. So they're a real lovely bee sanctuary. They, they really like comfrey flowers, um, a bit like foxglove flowers and borage and a few other things, but it's just got that lovely shape that they crawl into and they get shelter when it's raining. So um, comfrey, yeah, leaves the flowers for the bees and uh, it's the leaves or the roots that you can use of comfrey as a herbal medicine. They're, they're both um, really useful. Yeah. I have lots of comfrey here and yes, the bees adore it. Yeah, yeah. The bet that I'm going off topic now, but um, the, the plant that I have never seen as many bees on in my life uh, is uh, Phacelia which um, I don't know where it originates from or anything, but you can buy it as a, um, a, I think as a green manure, but also as a pollinator to attract bees in your garden. And it's got these beautiful pale blue sort of lilac tinged flowers. And I have planted a bed of that. I've never seen so many bees in my life as with that plant. It's absolutely stunning. I'll send round the, uh, I'll send that round in the, the email with the video recording because if you want to help the bees and I hope you all do um, plant some of that it's just stunning it's just beautiful to look at it really is yeah um, I love making comfrey infused oil and comfrey ointment I have read somewhere that comfrey shouldn't be eaten is that right well yeah for the reasons that I've given you um, it contains pyrolizal and alkaloids and if you take too much or if you've got an underlying problem with your liver then yeah it's very dangerous um, it's uh, the the use of comfrey internally as a herbal medicine is actually banned in Ireland and in, in the UK um, as far as I know they're still allowed to use comfrey leaf internally as a medicine but the extract of the root is banned internally for the con because of the concern with the pyrolizal and alkaloids um, but um, it, it's, a, it's an issue if you take too much or you've so too high a dosage for too long uh, or have an underlying problem with the liver short-term moderate uh, safe dose in a healthy person hasn't ever shown any problems um, as far as I know unless there's some new study but I'm sure I would have heard about it and um, the the um, the the internal comfrey use was banned from um, it was a it was a, a study that was done on rats and it wasn't done using a plant it was done just that contained pyrolizal and alkaloids so they're in borage and they're in colt's foot they're in several different herbs it was done by giving the alkaloids directly to the rats so i mean that is straight away a much more concentrated dosage than you would have from the plant and it's um what we find is when you look at the plants and their chemistry and what's in them um, although they'll contain a, a chemical that when given on its own can cause um, severe side effects or damage, when you give the plant um, we don't tend to find that there's the same issue because there are so many chemicals in the plants that um, there are other things in there that, that protect against those issues so you don't get the problem with it. So I'm jumping ahead to the summer now but a brilliant example of that is meadow sweet, which usually um, it's growing just now. You, you know, you can the young leaves are there for people who are experienced and know how to identify it. They're there, and I've been using it for about three weeks now. But um, it flowers in July and August, and it's just stunning, beautiful, sweet smell. Meadow sweet, it's gorgeous. Um, and um, in herbal medicine, meadowsweet is used as a natural antacid, so it soothes the digestive tract and and protects it and helps to relieve things like heartburn. Yet meadowsweet is actually the plant that is um, the original source of aspirin, um, and aspirin, as we know, um, it's it's. A, it's a wonderful medicine and it's so cheap to produce as well it's, it's a great drug that's been made um, but what can happen when people take aspirin regularly and people are often prescribed um, aspirin as a drug thinner to prevent strokes if there's a, a history of stroke so that's a good thing because we don't want people to have a stroke 
Um, but what can happen is um, the, the aspirin can erode the lining of the gut, so it damages the digestive system and people can basically the first warning of it usually is when people have bleeding from the bowel, which is very serious, you know, if blood starts coming out of there and it's not a hemorrhoid, it's a serious sign. Um, so, um, so aspirin, ha and that's not from overdosing an aspirin or, you know, taking too much by accident, that's from taking the correct, safe, prescribed dosage of the aspirin, yet it can do that. Whereas Meadowsweet, not only does it not cause that, it actually protects the digestive system. It's used by herbalists as an antacid. So there are, um, there are numerous examples of that. And uh, the, the comfrey is another one. And, and sadly, when things get banned, this happens with essential oils as well. It tends to be because the study has been done on the individual ke chemical or compound that's considered to be dangerous rather than on the actual plant. So it's a bit like saying, there's 200 chemicals in this, we're just going to look at this one here and we're discarding the other 199 and the other 199 are doing something too, you know? So it's not reflective of um, the use of the plant. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a thing in, if you look at cookbooks, especially when microbiotic uh, eating was trendy, it was, comfrey was in there, you know? But legally, um, you're not allowed to um, give it internally in Ireland, yeah. Um, you are, uh, you know, in the UK, and I don't know what the situation is in America. I'm out of touch with that. Um, is that okay on comfrey and confusing things? <laughs> would uh, Would you like to look at cleavers if you don't have any more questions? I just encourage you to. Um, try the sorrel, you know, if you know how to identify it. I'll show you when I go into the video course at, at the end, because it's um, it's very easy to identify, but it's just got such a delightful mini flavor. It's really good. Okay, so, uh, hang on, I've got a big mush here. So cleavers then, this is another interesting one. Anybody recognize this one? There we are. Here we are. Does anybody not recognize this one? You've all gone very quiet. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, cleavers, which is the, the sticky one. E-ticket bags. <laughs> I've never caught that before. Is that, is that a, um, that must be a predictive text typo, is it? Is it sticky bags? Is that what you're trying to write? E-ticket bags. <laughs> Oh, predictive text. Oh my goodness. And they want us to do medical consultations, you know, online and you just like, jeepers, I hope it's not based on algorithms and predict, um, uh, predictive text. <laughs> Can you imagine the things that would go wrong? I just made cleavers tincture, sticky bags. Yeah, absolutely. Sticky weeds, very good. Uh, yeah, comfrey is used in homeopathy for, bo yeah, bone knit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant for healing broken bones. Yeah, it's same in herbal medicine. Yep. It's all thumbs up. Yeah, sticky backs and predictive text. That's brilliant. Shame, I pulled a lot of cleavers from the allotment yesterday. That is a shame. Yeah, so cleavers is um, such an underrated plant. And um, I, I mean, I've always used it, but just using it more and more. and. Um, I, I, it just fascinates me. I'd love to, I, I do hope to get a research project going where we look at what's in it because other than uh, native herbs tend to be under researched compared to fancy foreign ones because um, uh, there, there's a lot of research going on in pharmaceutical companies and universities and things looking at plants and, uh, and fungi and uh, a lot of modern drugs um, some immunosuppressants are, are based on fungi and um, it's, uh, loads of drugs come from plants originally like you know the meadow sweet and um, the vincristin um, which is a chemotherapeutic drug it comes from periwinkle there's just loads and loads of examples of it but um, but our native herbs tend to get overlooked you know and um, I probably mentioned that when I spoke about daisy in the daisy class as well 
But um, comfrey is another one. So other than there being antioxidants in it, and I think really most plants are antioxidant, um, there isn't really anything of any great revelation that's that's been done. And yet it's just got such fascinating properties. So has anybody used it for anything? I know lots of you obviously have it in the garden and curse it, you know, so it creeps through the rose bushes and it just creeps everywhere. It might be strangling, choking out other plants that you're trying to cultivate, you know, and um, this one creeps up and, and uh, spreads and, and uh, chokes out other plants. Um, has anybody actually used it? Yeah, so Anne's saying she's used it as a tea. Yeah, and so is Lisa. Yep, it doesn't have a particular taste. No, it's you're right. It's quite, um, it's not strong on its own, and uh, I tend to mix it in with the other spring herbs like nettles and plantain and daisies and uh, various other bits and pieces that I do be drinking at this time of year. Yeah, lots of people have used it as a tea with uh, nettles. <clears throat> So um, it's um, it's good in a, in a spring tea. It's very refreshing. So I know I've mentioned it in other classes where um, it's just lovely to start to drink some of the wild herbs at this time of year because they're so nourishing and it really improves our energy. And um, also with the cleavers in there, the cleavers helps us I, I, th I find helps us with our energy because in in our body it helps uh, our kidneys to work well i don't mean go off and treat kidney disease you know it, it, in this this these three classes all i can do is open your eyes just a little bit to the to a few wild herbs and and the potential of them and um, and when i'm talking about things i'm talking about everything generally i'm not talking about um, just for just for general nutrition and well-being rather than uh, people with specific medical conditions and on different tablets and things because it's a different set of affairs with that and that's the sort of thing I'd be treating in my clinic um, but when people are on pharmaceuticals you know it depends which ones they are but some of them even just the nutrient content in, in herbs um, can be an issue with them um, as as they can, you know, the nutrient content in fruit and veg that you buy from the shop can be an issue with them as well. It's not unique to um, herbal medicines or wild foods. Anyway, so just so that you're aware, we're just speaking very generally. Um, but um, cleavers is um, is certainly used traditionally. It's thought to help the kidneys to work well. So um, you'll see, I'm not a fan of the term detox and detoxification uh, um, because I think it's very overused and misappropriated. And um, I think you're better to um, have good daily habits than to do some sort of extreme detox. You know, it's the things that we do on a regular basis that tend to have the biggest impacts on our life and it's it, it's much easier to just start to do a few good things um, that are easy for you to combine into your life than it is to do something extreme and it's the things that that are easy for you to incorporate so if you have cleavers and nettles on your doorstep and you just even if you just make tea with them you don't manage it every day if you manage it a few days a week then that is going to be of huge benefit to you if it's something that you can manage regularly um, so cleavers um because it seems to help the kidneys um do their job the kidneys are like a giant filter in the body they're separating out useful things that we want to keep and waste and uh, with the waste going that way uh, coming out with coming out as urine so because the kidneys deal with waste and cleavers seem to support the kidneys then yeah they are helping the body to um, get rid of waste from itself so it literally is detoxifying for want of a better expression so um, I do find that when you take it especially combined with the herbs that are rich in minerals at this time of year like the nettles and plantain it's very energizing you really do um, feel your energy lift as you drink it and uh, always drink it and I think why on earth do I still drink tea and coffee you know but anyway <laughs> I 
the answer being because I'm not perfect, thank you, thankfully. Um, but uh, it's it's a it's a there's a freshness and a vitality in it at this time of year that you don't get later in the year. And although you can dry herbs and make teas with dried herbs, I find there's there's a real freshness and vitality in them just now that you just get when the plant is out. Um, it's not the same. It, it's beneficial in, in other ways, but it's not the same um, when you use the dried herb to make the same drink. Um, so the other thing, yeah, Elaine's popped out in. I was just about to say that as well. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. No, we'll come on to... Um, so I'm going to do medicine uses, wild food uses, and then the cosmetics, because it's fascinating uh, for all three of them. So I'll come back to what, um, that's fine, Maria, you'll get the recording, don't worry. Um, I'll come back to what Mary's just put in, okay? Um, so yeah, I'm coming on to the other, the other part of the body that it really helps, um, uh, as well as the kidneys, is the lymphatic system. So in the body, um, the, the lymphatic system is a, is a circulation in the body. When um, we talk about the circulation, usually what we're referring to is blood and the movement of blood around the body. But the second major system of circulation in the body is the lymphatic system. And um, there's various different things involved in that, but um, particularly the lymph nodes. So you've got little lymph nodes under your chin along the edges there and chains, chains of them going down the neck. They're all, there's lymph nodes in there. Your tonsils are lymph nodes. There are lymph nodes in the armpit, the breast tissue it contains lymph. Um, and there are lymph nodes in the groin as well. And usually the first indication that you have that something's wrong with your lymphatic system is uh, swollen glands, yeah? And uh, they tend to be sore when there's an infection and it can be difficult to swallow, especially if it's your tonsils. So that's our lymphatic system. So uh, when people are very prone to tonsillitis or swollen glands, these are the sort of herbs that herbalists turn to. To my knowledge, there isn't a drug that works on the lymphatic system. It seems to be something that we have a lot of tools for in herbal medicine, but I, I haven't ever come across um, a drug that's used that way. Um, that's been developed for that purpose. Um, cleavers is really, really safe. Um, another one that can be useful on the lymphatic system is red clover. There are, are a few of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just a good thing because to, to be taking herbs, you know, fairly regularly to keep that system moving and healthy, the lymph contains uh, is fluid that's in the lymphatic system through these pipes and these these nodules, these nodes, and um, it's it's thicker than blood or water, and um, it's more viscous, so it moves more slowly. And one of its functions is to again to come back to detoxification is to take waste away from the cells. So obviously, if that is is slower than um, it could be, then we'll be more tired. Um, and uh, because more waste is circulating in our system, you know, we want you want to empty the bins, keep emptying the bins, you know, <laughs> or the compost. You don't leave the compost there all overflowing and building up and smelly, you know. So we don't want that going on in our body either. We want to keep keep our limit, keep uh, taking things away, you know. Um, so cleavers can be um, really good for that, and it's something that I don't recommend you start drinking beakers of juice. Um, and, um, oh yeah, Angela, yeah, I'm coming on to that, don't worry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading the comments, um, so, um, the, uh, so I don't recommend you put beakers, or you, you start juicing it in huge amounts, but the tea is just something that it's very safe to drink a lot of, um, so it's really, really useful. Um, the other thing that can happen with the lymph is, um, and it's a sign of much more serious disease, is, um, you know, when you see it, it's usually elderly people and they've got very, very swollen ankles. 
Um, do you know what I mean? And um, that is the the lymph fluid that's um, usually that's um, that's that's congealing there, and it's actually usually a sign that there's there's heart disease there. The heart's not working properly, so kind of I won't get too technical with it, but the whole system sort of backs up. Um, and affects the kidneys, which puts the blood pressure up, and that's why when people have um, different heart problems, they're they're given a diuretic. It's to help to lose fluid and take pressure off the kidneys. Um, so, but that's a really obvious example to see of um, where there's the lymph isn't moving properly. Um, so that would be an, that that would be the sort of thing that a herbalist would deal with in in their clinic and liaison with the doctor. Um, what would you recommend for the lymphatic system, tea or tincture? Okay, so that's a great question. Thank you. Um, the, the teas are the easiest ways to make herbal medicines, and they are the most inexpensive way because if you've got the fresh herb, you can go out and pick it for free. If you don't have the fresh herb, you can buy the dried herb, and uh, dried herbs are inexpensive to buy. And all you do, whether it's the fresh or the dried herb, is put the herb in the pot, pour on boiled water and let it infuse, usually for five or 10 minutes. And, and there are other instances where you can let it infuse for several hours. It just depends on the herb and your health and uh, what it is you're trying to treat. Um, and you strain off the herb then, put that on the compost and drink the liquids. And um, tinctures then are where the um the herb has been extracted in alcohol so you might not have heard the word tincture but you will have used it because the echinacea drops that you buy from the health food shop is a tincture of the herb echinacea so it's just the herb that's been steeped in alcohol for a couple of weeks and then strained off and uh, alcohol is an excellent solvent and preservative so it extracts and preserves the um, the properties, the chemicals in the plant, and it concentrates them. So with a tea, if you're trying to treat something rather than just for your general health, you might be trying to drink half a litre or a litre of the herbal tea uh, every day. With a tincture, um, the dosages again vary, but an average dose would tend to be something like a teaspoon three times a day. So it's a much more concentrated dose. So it's it's a smaller volume that you need to take to still get the medicinal benefits. So um, this is a herbal tincture here, or a DIY home one. Uh, this is with red clover. And um, it's just the jam, a clean dry jam jar. Pop your herb into it. Cover it with the strongest alcohol that you've got. So for um, home use version, it's usually vodka or brandy. They're the strongest spirits that we can buy in the shop. And um, leave it to steep for two weeks and then strain it off and you're left with your murky brown liquid. So pour it into a bottle and put a label on it because they all look the same. <laughs> They all look the same uh, when you've made them, so put a label on it so you know which one is which. Um, but that's um, red clover tincture, and you would make cleavers tincture, or dandelion tincture, or daisy tincture, whatever, all the same way. Uh, and to come back to Leah's question about which would I recommend for lymphatic system tea or tincture, um, the, the, the thing that's right for you to do is, it's not that one would work better than the other, it, the, it's just that some people are really good at drinking teas uh, and will have no issue drinking them and other people just won't do it. And so if that's the case, then the tincture is the right thing to do because it's much easier and um, it's much more convenient for people. Um, obviously, it's a lot more expensive to make because it requires a lot of good quality alcohol to make it. So um, it's a much more expensive extract. But also when you make it, um, you know, they keep for years. Tinctures keep for years because um, nobody ever opens a bottle of vodka and brandy and says, oh, that's gone off and pours it down the sink, you know. So they keep for years. You can also make um, tinctures with vinegar if you don't want to use alcohol. Vinegar is an excellent solvent, you know, so cider vinegar, white wine vinegar or red wine vinegar are usually the best ones to use. Um, but I, I will just advocate for teas one more time because 
I do think that teas, um, so when we're talking about medicinal strength, um, herbal teas, they bear absolutely no resemblance to the things that you get, the herbal tea bags that you get, because it's huge amounts of herbs that we use to make a, a proper infusion. Uh, herbal tea bags contain, you know, what, a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of a herb. Um, we, we might be using two dessert spoons, an ounce, you know, a lot of, of the herb if we're making them properly. So they bear no resemblance to things in tea bags. That's, that would be a medicinal dosage for a mouse, but not for a, a human being. Um, and um, they, sorry, I've still got plantain flowers. <laughs> I'm irritating my nose, it's so funny. <laughs> I've never had that happen before. It was just the way they moved when I was picking them, it's funny. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, with teas, I, I will advocate that they are more therapeutic and beneficial than the other methods, because if you are drinking a liter of a herbal infusion that's really good for you, then it's, it's not just that you're drinking that and it's good for you, it's that you're drinking a liter less a day of other things that aren't so good for you. So it might just mean you cut out, you know, one cup of tea or coffee. So that's less caffeine and less stress on your system. So I will absolutely argue that in most cases, unless there are some circumstances where the, the things that are particularly beneficial in the plant aren't soluble in water, they won't come out if we make tea. We need a solvent like alcohol to extract them. Um, or, or a fat in some cases, actually, like oil. But um, discarding those, I, I will absolutely um, advocate for really, you know, good, strong herbal teas or herbal infusions, because it's not just that you get the benefit of them. It's just that if, you, if you've got a litre of that in you every day, there's a, there's a litre less room for, for the bad things, for the bad habits. So it's much, much easier to do more good things than it is to try and give up a bad habit. If you just do more good things, you'll automatically start to do less of the, the bad things or the, the things that aren't doing us any good and it will start to fall away and it's just a much easier approach to life in general. Yeah. How long... Uh, no, it's not a silly question. There are great questions coming in here. Okay, um, can you refrigerate any leftover tea and use it later? You do, you can... Um, so teas, with herbal teas, don't throw them out, okay? Uh, I must send that round again. I wrote a nice art newsletter article about that a wee while ago. So herbal teas, I will always advocate, don't, don't throw them out, don't pour them down the sink. So if it's 24 hours or less, then we can drink them. Now, teas do not contain a preservative. They're just herbal tea and they're just the herb and water. So water is full of oxygen and bacteria need oxygen to grow. So bacteria will start to grow in a water extract. Yeah, we know that we don't pour a glass of water on a Monday, leave it lying in the room and come back on a Saturday morning and, and drink it and think it's going to be okay. We all know that, you know? So, um, so um, because bacteria will build up when water's stagnant, you know, we don't drink stagnant water. So um, herbal teas, we need to drink them internally within 24 hours. You can refrigerate them, you can have them hot or cold, it doesn't matter. Some people much prefer them cold, especially in the summer. It, cold herbal tea with some ice in it is really nice, you know, very refreshing. Um, but um, so you don't need to, um, you don't, you, yeah, anyway, they'll only 24 hours or less we drink them. 48 hours or less, we can use them on our skin or hair. Um, there are lots of um, herbal teas made from different herbs that make good toners for the skin. Just keep them away from your eyes or, and your mouth because if there's, you know, bacteria levels that have built up, um, just keep it away from your eyes because you don't want to get an eye infection from it. Um, but uh, on your skin as a toner, um, lovely. On the hair as a, as a hair rinse as well, really good to strengthen the hair and improve the, the health of the scalp a lot of the time with um, certain herbal teas like nettle or rosemary. There's, there's uh, a lot of them that can be used that way. And then after 48 hours, 
um, they start to get really smelly. <laughs> so you don't want to smell of um, any organic gardeners on and to know the smell of the nettle liquid that you make as a fertilizer. You don't want to smell like that. You have to have overalls on when you apply it, I think, to your garden because it's so stinky. So 48 hours or older, pour the herbal teas on your plants, whether it's outside and it's weeds on the crack in the pavement, they will thank you for it. Or it's your pot plants, it's the indoor, um, your house plants, but I mean plants that are potted, not pots, not plants that are pots, sorry. <laughs> indoor, indoor plants <laughs> rather than pot plants <laughs> or plants of pot. Um, so um, just use them instead of water, you know, because it's full of minerals. It's so good for them. And you'll really see them perk up when you, you use that. It's really good nutrients for them. So don't throw them away. Yeah. Um, is a tincture? No, I think I covered this, but I'll just do that. Is a tincture always made with alcohol? So no, a tincture it can be made with vinegar as well. So the cider vinegar, white wine or red wine vinegar tend to be the best ones. You will also see um, a, a tinctures made with glycerates, made with glycerin um, for sale. But I mean, I'd actually argue they're not really tinctures because uh, glycerin is um, sugar derived. So it's not the same solvent as alcohol and vinegar. So it extracts different chemicals and it, it is very sweet tasting. So I would put glycerates uh, glycerin extracts into a category of the, their own called glycerates basically as their own unique extract rather than talking about them being a base for a tincture because they don't produce the same medicine so different solvents will extract different properties from a plant um, and um, it, you know you'll, you'll be wanting to use the appropriate one for whatever it is you're, you're um, treating. Uh, you're welcome. Um, is it important during which phase of the moon the tincture has started? So that's a lovely question. So it's really, um, if you have got the time and the resources to work with plants in cycle with the phases of the moon, then it's a really useful thing to do. And it's not it's not hippie stuff. It's actually in terms of we know the moon controls the tides. The moon has an effect on water levels. So the moon also has an effect on the levels of water in a plant. You know, there's a lot of water and sap and things in the plant. So at different phases of the moon, it will be higher in the plant than the other phases where it will be lower. And in terms of extract making, um, it doesn't matter where you're picking things fresh and you're going to consume them right away, but where you're making an extract, um, the purpose is, one of the purposes is so that you have got your herbal medicine available to take at a time of year where you can't go out and pick the fresh plant. So your extracts have to be preserved well and properly, otherwise they'll go mouldy or they'll ferment or they'll explode. So if you, this is one of the reasons there's so much emphasis on picking your herbs during a spell of dry weather. It's not good enough that you've got one dry day in a period of three weeks where it's been raining, you know, either side because the plant will be saturated and it will have taken up more water than usual. And that means whatever you try and make with it will have too much water in it. So it will alter the, the amount of preservative that you need. So that might be your alcohol or honey or sugar. Or, so sugar, if you're making a syrup, honey, if you're making an infused honey, um, vinegar or alcohol, if you're making a tincture. So um, it does actually make a difference. Um, if you've got time, it just takes time and commitment to be able to follow it that way. So um, if you're able to do that, then that's absolutely great and it, and it will make a difference. Yeah, yeah it's just, um, especially where you're dealing with a wet climate, it's, it, I think it's quite difficult to, um, to do because I would prioritize harvesting the herbs during dry weather over harvesting them during the perfect phase of the moon because they'll definitely your extracts definitely won't work if you get them during period of wet weather so that's part of the difficulty I've 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 experienced with that but it will depend where you live it's very wet where I live um it will depend where you live and how much you know how much time you can commit to what what you're able to do but yeah 
Great question. Um, thank you. Um, how long does a dried herb keep its its qualities? So we can dry. Um, you can dry any herb that you want to use medicinally. So any flower or leaves or stems or uh, roots or barks or seeds. Um, the the way to dry them is to dry them out of direct light and away from um, direct heat. And uh, the crucial thing is that it's in a space that isn't damp. It doesn't need to be hot, but you must make sure that the, the room or the space that you dry them in, there aren't any issues with damp. And then um, as long as you've dried them well and then you store them well. So what I recommend you do after they feel dry so I've got um, I've got some days. In fact, I've got things drying. Hang on, let me see if I can turn the round signal kind of over. So this is um, can you see that? That's my air dryer, and these are um, daisies, uh, layers of daisies drying there. Whoops, in it. Woo! So that's suspended from the ceiling. And I'll send round the link for where you get one of those as well, because they're just the easiest way ever to dry herbs. And I'm all for easy. There are enough things in life that are difficult without being stuck a load of faff. Um, so anyway, when daisies are dry, they're, they're, they're like this. And maybe you can hear me rubbing that. You can hear that they're crisp. Um, so they'll feel very dry and crisp generally when they're properly dried. Then what I recommend you do is you store them in paper bags because even when they've got to that crisp and dry feeling phase, they'll still continue to lose moisture for quite a while. If you put them straight into a, a jar and uh, that's um, airtight and uh, with a lid, you're welcome. Thanks, Breezy. <laughs> um, then uh, if you put them straight into that, then you'll trap moisture and they'll go mouldy. So. Um, leave them in paper bags because the air will continue to circulate for a while and then I, I, what I do is I store them in Tupperware tubs in the paper bags and that's that's the way I found that they store the best. Stay away from the glass because again the glass um, heats up and um, you know if there's any light in your room it will heat up and um, that will that will um, cause them to lose more and trap moisture from condensation and they'll go mouldy. Um, so that's the way I store them. Now you should get, um, as long as you've dried them properly, at least two years out of them. They don't go off. Dried herbs don't go off. They just get less potent as they age. And um, I, so, um, you know, remember the craze in the 1980s for the spice racks and um, everybody had little jars of oregano and sage and things in these little clear jars and they were sitting on <laughs> in the full sunshine in the kitchen and then people would move house 10 years later and they would bring their their still their little jars of herbs in their spice rack and the herbs instead of being a vibrant sort of um, pale green color would be bleached to this sort of really bland yellow you know and it so they did they weren't going off but just as they get older they get less and less potent you know so the, the, the things that will go wrong with them is if they get damp you just you'll smell it actually before you see it and uh, when it gets quite big you'll see the blue mold on them but you'll smell that they're damp and moldy if you smell damp stuff then quick it out um, because that's it starting to go and it will go rapidly um, but uh, it, they're, they're fine if you keep them properly yeah the drying herbs is just again it's like teas it's the simplest most inexpensive way to process them and keep them and you can use them to make teas uh, you can use them to make tinctures infused vinegars um, infused oils poultices even uh, from dried herbs they work really really well yeah can guarantee my mother still has a few of those jars from the 1980s. <laughs> yes, yeah, sparing them. Oh yeah, the other thing that will go wrong with dried herbs when they're old is that you might start to see like, like little bugs and weevils in them if they're not stored in something that's got a lid. So a bit like 
um, at the back of the kitchen cupboard, you might find a packet of cereal that you bought and didn't eat, you know, if it's like several years old. That's another very 1980s thing as well. But um, And you'll sometimes see little weevils or whatever in it. That's the other thing that can happen to really old um, dried herbs. Yeah, yeah. So just watch out for those. Um, do you use fire grass? Do you mean fireweed? Do you mean the, the willow herb, the euporium? Euporium. Um, it grows. It grows here. Yeah. Um, if that's the one you mean, you need to come back to me with whether or not that's the one you mean. Uh, I haven't heard it called that before. Yeah, fireweed. Yeah. So, um, do you know, it grows here as do loads of the wild um, willow bay herbs, and um, I haven't actually used it because their function is that they're really astringent. And um, I just have loads of other herbs that I use for that already. So I use lots of silverweed and potentilla, like the, the um, tormental, and there are just loads of herbs I use for that already. So I haven't just because um, there's, there's no shortage of astringent herbs growing, but um, I know um, uh, my friend and colleague Bev, Beverly Gray, she uses loads of it. She's a um, Canadian herbalist who also comes and goes from Ireland and um, um, she's um, she wrote the uh, Boreal Herbal. It's really good wild food and her medicinal herbs in Canada. So um, she was the first one that um, spoke to me about using fireweed. She uses that a lot. Um, but 10 years later, I've still not got around to it, which just goes to show how many things there are, you know, because I'm not short of things to try out. Yeah, it's lovely. I do like, it's nice because I think with the fire read as well, um, I might start to use it because um, in normal circumstances, I, I do go over and teach in London and um, it grows a lot there actually. I got some nice photos of it just growing in waste ground there. So I think I might just start to use it because it's a really good city one uh, so it's a good one to show people there makes a wonderful tea high in iron yeah 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 I mean it's got loads of properties it's lovely but the pink flowers are just gorgeous aren't they yeah thank you um, I'm just going to go back through this because there were several other things uh, to finish off the cleavers we didn't get we only just got started on that um, I might need to change these to one herb <laughs> per class I was doing six when I started in March. I don't know what's happened. <laughs> I was doing six in less time than it's taking to do one now. Nettles smell like cat's pee. Does anyone else think this? <laughs> I haven't seen that with, uh, I haven't heard anybody to say that with nettles. Fresh elderflowers. People are always saying that about fresh elderflower as it smells of cat's pee. You're doing a great job. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, da, 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 just checking I've got these ones. Right, okay, yeah, Angela, you asked me for the cosmetic -y things. I will get to that because they're very interesting. But I'm going to pick back up on the cleavers if that's okay. Um, so the other, so remember we spoke about it in terms of kidney function and lymph. Um, the other medicinal use it has that, um, that, um, the other medicinal use it has that, that um, has fallen out of use a bit in herbal medicine. Some herbalists still use it this way. But again, there's just loads of herbs that can be used for this and very successfully. Is um, it's, It was used to treat leg ulcers. So coming back to the lymph and heart problems again, if you look at, um, if you've seen elderly people and they've got lots of bandages around their legs, um, it's it's usually because they've got varicose or arterial ulcers on their legs. Now they're they're notoriously hard to treat in uh, conventional medicine, and and really all that happens is they're bandaged a couple of times a, a, a week at the by by the nurse um, who changes the dressing on them, and the compression is the best they can do to try and stop them spreading, and it just goes on and on indefinitely. Really, um, they're they're, they're, they're caused by poor circulation, which is caused by there being problems with the heart. So that there's a, they're a sign that there's something quite serious going on. So it's not a DIY thing that you'd be doing, but there are a range of different herbs that can really help a great deal with um, these types of ulcers. But cleavers was one of those, and cleavers was applied as a poultice, and it seems to help to 
regrow the tissue. And um, some herbalists are still using it that way. Um, that's fine, you're welcome. People are going, I know it's, it's lunchtime yet. Yeah, just watch the video, you know, just pick up the recording uh, when it comes around, don't worry. You can do that whenever it suits you. <laughs> um, so cleavers um, was used, it, it seems to help the tissue regenerate and it had a brilliant reputation for healing up these ulcers. So much so that it was used right here um, by a consultant in St Vincent's Hospital in Dublin. And um, he was in charge of the ward with the people with these ulcers. And um, it's a very difficult, as I've mentioned, it's a very difficult thing to treat. Um, and uh, he was exasperated because he couldn't get people better and they were, you know, so he couldn't move them out of the beds and get other people in that he could treat because they weren't getting better so there wasn't anywhere for these people to go. So um, he looked at the, the Materia Medica, the, the herbs that had been used and you know, this, this was sort of in the mid 1800s and it, it's not that long ago that um, herbal medicine has been shifted into this alternative medicine category, but that's a very recent thing and um, very unrepresentative of medicine for thousands of years because physicians and doctors relied on plant-based prescriptions as well. And uh, from what I am seeing, are certainly coming back round to it again. So he um, read that cleavers had been used to help. He sent his uh, medical students out to go and harvest it. They made extracts of it. And not only did it help, it worked so well, especially in stubborn cases where the ulcers were just so bad that he wrote a paper on it uh, for the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, and sent that in um, to let other doctors know so that they could try using it. And he, it worked so well that they managed to come up with some sort of method of extracting and preserving it because cleavers isn't fresh for very long. It's really only, you can get good quality cleavers fresh for about three months. It doesn't stay fresh, you know, later in the year. It's got a, a fairly fast growing cycle. So um, that was how useful it was uh, there. So I do have a copy of the uh, his article from the BMJ. It's fascinating. So um, the amount of permission you would have to get, go through all the committees to get permission to do that nowadays. But anyway, um, he, he was most impressed with it. So there's a story right there from one of our hospitals. Um, is that all right, guys? Are you okay? Um, so I'll come on to the cosmetic uses because I'm being prompted. Could I send that document? Yeah, I'll send it with the email. Yeah, of course I will. It's in the video course, um, but I'll pop it round. I think it goes, I've got a newsletter article about cleavers that goes out as well, and the link to it's in that as well. But I, I use it, um, I got permission, I got copyright for the for using the article and I, I use it in talks a lot, I've got it on slides. You're welcome. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so um, to come on to uh, cosmetic uses, yeah, so this fasc fascinates me as well. So um it was used um not that i think there's anything wrong with them there's a there's a lot if you look at the old books there's a lot of treatments that, to, that claim to get rid of freckles i think they obviously they seem to spend most of their time trying to get rid of freckles i think <laughs> if you look at the old herbs um herbal books i don't know why i like freckles um but i have used it um with someone who had sunspots i don't mean we're not getting into skin cancer and, and, and all of that stuff. Um, I just mean discoloration um, that wasn't malignant. That, so we knew it was safe, we had it checked out, we knew it wasn't anything dodgy, it was just this discoloration. And we used cleavers extract on that because she wanted to try something. And I said, well, they used to use that for freckles, so let's give that a go. And it's, it's so safe, it's not going to do any harm. So we got great results with that, actually. It improved a great deal. And then, the, but the thing that it's wonderful for is as a natural deodorant, it makes a brilliant um, natural deodorant and um, it's really, really simple to make and it works so much better than lots of the um, natural deodorants that you can buy in the shop. And all you do is you get the cleavers and um, get a handful of it, pop it in a pan, 
pour on boiled water and simmer it for sort of five or 10 minutes and strain it off. And, and when it's cool, you just sponge it onto wherever you would usually, uh, onto the armpits, wherever you would usually apply deodorant. And uh, it works brilliantly. It doesn't have an aroma. You can um, chuck a bit, bit of essential oil in it if you want. Just make sure that you shake it really well before you apply it because um, otherwise the essential oil will float to the, the surface of the water and it might burn you depending on which essential oil, oil you have chosen. But if you just use cleavers on its own, there isn't any issue like that. And it just works wonderfully. You um, will need to make it up every few days because it's just water and it doesn't contain a preservative, um, but it's really effective. And um, so you can make a batch of that. And, you know, on the first day you can drink it as tea, but whatever you've got left over, you can apply as a deodorant. It's great. Um, and uh, one of my students who's a professional natural cosmetic formulator actually managed to, she was so taken with this DIY kitchen um, deodorant that she went off and she managed to turn it into a professional um, deodorant with a six month shelf life. So that made my year when she did that, yeah. So I'm going to make deodorant after lunch. <laughs> do you know what I probably should do? <laughs> you have to keep doing it every few days, yeah, yeah. They're still quite small here. I'm just, I'm just um, waiting for them to get tall enough. They're still just not quite plentiful enough for me to get at them at the moment, so. So there we are. Are there any more questions about cleavers? The final thing I would say, oh yeah, the other thing, one of my students was doing, we were all making uh, anti-wrinkle treatments with it last year. So you can just, um, I think you just blend it up. Was that what it was? It was a green extract people were whizzing up and applying to their skin. And uh, I think it's from, uh, is uh, I think it's from um, Maria Trebin's book. She was a Swiss her herbalist health through God's Pharmacy, her book, and she was recommending applying um, it's either blended cleavers or cleavers juice to the skin to treat wrinkles. I can't remember. Yeah, I must check that again. But that was a, that was a huge hit. Maybe it was two years ago. I suppose if I can't remember, it must have been two years ago. Is your friend selling the deodorants? She's not, she, I don't think she's selling them, but she certainly she teaches formulation. So she's she based, so she teaches how to formulate cosmetics from natural ingredients. So she based the whole deodorant chapter in one of her books on the cleavers extract. Yeah, so I can send that round as well, if you like. Um, so you can follow up on that if you like, because that book's really nice. It's, um, I think it's only 21 ingredients all the cosmetics are based on in it. So it's a nice home DIY. Uh, I'm just writing that down so I remember to send it. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. She's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? Are you all right? Um, so I'll give you, I'll ju we'll just finish off, we'll just do whatever it is, five minutes or whatever. I'll just show you what the video course is like, just in case any of you want to go on and learn um, a bit more in more detail. Um, so I'm just going to uh, share my screen here and, and show you it because it's easy peasy to use. And um, so this is my website. Could somebody please could somebody please type something into the chat bar for me because when I pull up the screen share option the chat bar disappears and it wrecks my nerves because yes thanks right something's happening it doesn't appear then I need to give it a minute for it to appear it's the most nerve-wracking thing I don't know why it does it Whoop. it's definitely a design flaw with um, the software where is it? And then if I exit out of it, it's going to come back again. There, there, it does it every time I can. You can see everything. Great. Okay, I'm going back again. Ah. There, it's there now. Right, okay. So I've got you. You're welcome, Angela. You're very welcome. If you want to follow up on it, then um, I'll, the video is usually ready about four o'clock. Takes a wee while to process it. So this is my uh, website. For those of you that haven't been on it, here it is. The e-course, uh, great, thanks, Bear. The the e-course, uh, this particular one, the, the video one, uh, it's called Learn with the Seasons, Forage for and Use Edible Medicinal Herbs. 
and I've been running it since 2015. So what I did was I just filmed local herbs that are easy to identify and showed, so I've filmed identification videos for them all and have filmed uh, videos or done photo lessons showing people how to use them as wild foods or herbal medicines. So we cover all the basic herbal medicine extracts, so teas, decoctions, tinctures, vinegars, infused honeys, oxymels, um, infused oils, ointments, compresses and poultices. And we do pesto, salads, syrups, cordials, um, chutney, various other things like that uh, from via the wild food. So, um, oh, you're very welcome, Nora. <laughs> I get really nice messages popping in. So you just click on the members um, button and this brings you to this page. And if you've enrolled in the course, then you just sign in with um, whichever email address you enrolled with and a password. So that's all you need. You don't need Instagram or Facebook or um, or or you don't need to use Zoom. I know we're all on Zoom just now, but I only use Zoom for doing Q and A webinars. So I support this course for my students because I know that the difference between people being able to do something and and not is the anxiety of knowing whether or not they're doing it correctly and for all the videos are there and they're very clear it's sometimes it's not until you start doing something that you get more questions and doubts and the thing that makes the difference then is being able to ask a teacher um, to are you doing the right thing explain why you are or you're not or why you might see other people online doing it a very different way and to explain the merits and the drawbacks of those different ways. So it's to give you the confidence to do it yourself. And because this is the sixth year of me teaching people this way, I know it makes a difference with people because uh, I get so many messages from them telling me that. So <laughs> can't wait to get stuck in. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 lovely, thanks. <laughs> So there's just a little video here of me explaining how to use the course. I've essentially typed the same thing below it, so you don't need to watch it if you don't want to. Um, that's me saying the course is supported. So with the, there's the option to join one of these webinars where you can ask questions. So we've got one due next week for um, students. I think it's on Wednesday evening. Um, I usually do them once a month when the course is in season. So that's usually from late March or April through till um, early November actually now, certainly the end of October, but quite often early November. I usually do them once a month, but at the moment so many people are joining, I'm, I'm running them every two weeks. Um, so yeah, the next one's Wednesday the 29th. Um, there's a Facebook group. You can join it if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want to. It is nice in there. Um, there's people are sharing different recipes that they've got that I've not got in the course. It's really is interesting just now, but um, there's that is not compulsory. Don't do it if you don't want to. And then down at the bottom here are the courses. So I've just divided them to make it easy for people to engage with the plants that are in season around them at the time. Um, I've divided them into seasons and there's at least 150 videos in the course but all of them are under 10 minutes apart from the webinars you know the webinar recordings are an hour but they're just me answering people's questions the actual lesson videos are all under 10 minutes to make it easy to dip in and out of and refer back to so that you're not scrolling through an hour of video to try and find the 30 seconds that you wanted to hear again so we'll go into the spring and early summer course because that's what's in season just now. And up at the top um, are the information and guidelines. So I've written all these guides to keep you safe. So there's medical information, safety foraging and herbal medicine safety. So that's the difference between general health and if you might have a, a medical problem and be on pharmaceutical medicine or be pregnant. Um, you know, just make sure the first time you log into this course that you do read these, they're not long, or, or watch the videos. Some of them have got videos in them as well. You just click on them to load them. Definitely stick to the safety instructions for foraging, please. I've taught, literally taught thousands of people and have got a 100% record of nobody dying. <laughs> So don't you be the first, okay? Um, because you'll feel like a wally and then you'll be dead. <laughs> Let me come on to the plant lessons. So 
lots of plants that we've spoken about here over the last few weeks, plantain, nettle, dandelion, um, primroses. For those of you who were here last week, that's my primrose honey. It's coming on well, it smells delicious. Um, okay, so we'll go into, I said I'd show you the sorrel, is it, didn't I? Because that's got good identification stuff. Um, okay, so the common name is there and the Latin name is there. So that's, the Latin name is key for identifying things because like the fire, what did you call it? Fire? I call it, I know it's fire read, you called it fire something else. Um, that was a new name on me anyway. If we use the Latin name, we know that we're always talking about the correct plant. So this is a sorrel and actually this is a lovely photo from the small leaf to the biggest. You'll see I laid them out like that and they all have those points at the base of the leaf, no matter how small it is or tattered it is. And again, I show that in the video. So there's an, so at the top is the contents of the lesson and they've all got an identification video and photos, close-ups of photos to show you. They've all got a herbal data sheet, which is jargon-free language I've used um, to help you understand the herb. Is it a tree? Is it a leaf? Is it big? Is it small? Which bit to use? What's the point in using it? I'll go through that with you as well. And, um, and uh, you know, whatever video lessons or photo lessons there are. So for identification, just click on the tab there with the video and that will bring up the ID. So that, do you see the way the sorrel grows in a clump in long grass? That's, it's, videos are great because with books, I mean, I've got hundreds of books on, um, I've got hundreds of books on identi on herbs. But um, with, with books, it's, there's only so many photos you can print without bankrupting the publisher. For me, the point of an online course is not to sit for hours reading text on the screen. It's that you can host hundreds of photos, which really help with identification, but also then videos, because even with photos, you can look at them and think, I know what the plant looks like, but it doesn't look like that. And um, so it's it's really really useful to have the video because you can show the location that it grows in and um, the size of the plant compared to um a person i'm very short you know but people quite often muddle up for example elderflower because they just google things and see white flowers and go off and pick any white flower to make cordial or lemonade not realizing that the elder is a tree so they're not getting the most basic bit of identification so that, that's actually the tiny little flowers. Whoever was asking about uh, sorrel, they are the flowers there, you know, so you can see why I didn't use them as a massive identification feature. They're so small. Um, so there we go. And you'll see the habitat that it grows in. And uh, the sound on the video is very clear because um, I used a professional filmmaker to film it with me and we used a professional microphone because otherwise, YouTube's covered in iPhone things with the sound going, you know, <laughs> where you can't hear because of the wind. So um, we made sure the sound was really good quality when we were outdoors, not least because the weather was awful the year I decided to film this course, which made it very challenging. Anyway, so close-ups of sorrel growing, close-ups of the leaf, so it's really distinctive with the tips there, with the pointed tips. And then you can see the different leaf sizes and how they're all pointed. So loads and loads of ID things there. If you pay attention to that, you will never ever muddle it up with lords and ladies. Okay, so then the data sheet's here and you can either read it on screen or um, you can print it off. So it's in color on screen to make it easier on the eye, but the print version here is a PDF and you just click, click the link to download it and it's in black and white. So you're not going to, bankrupt yourself um, in printer ink, which is always a hazard. Um, so just where possible, I've got the names in Latin. Uh, well, I've always got them in Latin and English, but often French, German, uh, Irish, Spanish, and Italian as well. Uh, sometimes Chinese if they grow in China as well. Um, so just what is it? What kind of plant is it? Is it a weed? Is it a tree? Can you eat it? when do you harvest it? There's a thing, don't muddle it up with lords and ladies. There's my tips to make sure that you try and make sure, do all I can to make, do my best to 
help you um, not to make that mistake? Are there any precautions with medical diseases or medication? What's its benefit as a food? Any recipes? So we've got sorrel, salad and sauce. It's history as a medicine. So as I mentioned, sorrel isn't used that way anymore, but things like plantain, dandelion, red clover, loads of uh, medical information on those cleavers. And so included in that is safe and effective home remedies for you to do at your home. And then also more serious medical conditions that people would usually go to a herbal medicine clinic to, to work on with a, somebody qualified. Um, I've also got bits in it where, if, uh, where um, if you want to read more about the plant, where there's a book that's got a really good chapter on it, then I recommend those specific books. Um, so John Wright's Hedgerow book is brilliant, especially on um, not just his recipes, but on the identification photos showing young lords and ladies and young sorrel. So um, it's it's really good. And he is very, very funny. He's the forager from the River Cottage. He's great. He's a lovely guy. So down at the bottom then, recipe and extract section. So there's the video showing you how to make the sorrel sauce. And um, so again, you just click the link and the video will play. And you can watch it on the screen like this, or you can click the, the thing to make it full size. Um, some people pop it on their phone playing in their kitchen and cook along to it, you know, so they make the thing while they watch the video, which I've been told is really helpful. Um, the other thing is um, just an example of a forage salad there. So that's got sorrel, hawthorn, red clover, daisy, dandelion, all sorts of bits and pieces in there. Um, so the plant lessons are all um, similar and then uh, if you come down um, to that you'll find the herbal extract guides. So these are in various plant lessons but just to make it easier for you to go back and find, uh, look up how to make different herbal extracts, I've just popped them in here as an easier reference. So um, drying herbs, tinctures, making ointments, if we click on that one, we'll see um, plantain, I think. We've got plantain. Um, yep, so that's me drying plantain leaves to make the infused oil. And then that's me um, using the infused oil with beeswax to make an ointment. And again, you can just, uh, that's real beeswax. That's real County Clare beeswax, actually. Yeah. Um, and again, the written instructions are there or you can print them in uh, black and white, download them and print them in black and white. Um, and uh, whoops. So then we've got webinars. So I did special guest ones with experts on sharing their specialities. So we've got things on uh, brewing with herbs, making alcoholic drinks, um, using them in cocktails, um, foraging in the city, growing a medicinal herb garden. There's all sorts of things there. And uh, my huge thanks to my guests who helped me with those and shared their, their specialist interests. They're very interesting. They're about a lot more than the title of the webinar, even the Wild Booze one. It's just, we, Craig and I spent so much time talking about the special connection with nature and, and plants. Even if, if you don't drink, please, it's, it's, it's still worth, um, it's worth a listen. If, it's not a, if alcohol's not a trigger topic for you, it's worth a listen because we spoke so much about how it connects you to nature. It's, it was really special. And he's a city-based forager as well. He's in Leeds. Um, these are the recordings of the ones I'm doing for my students, so you can just look them up by date if you've missed them, and I always do a little summary of what we've talked about during the time. Um, and then down at the bottom, there's the dates for the next webinars, and then there's resources, so recommended books on, some people might be really interested in edible flowers, or um, or, or brewing, or or cooking, or herbal medicine, or you know, I've I've got them there to to help people follow up, and recommended suppliers of ingredients, so bottles and jars and things. You'll need that if you start um, making different things, and I've got a few other guides I wrote about um, tips for city foraging and other bits and pieces. Um, that's fine. You're welcome. You can go in if you like, lads. Don't worry. Um, so that's it basically, and. Um, just because every, because there's so much interest and uh, people are having a hard time just now, 
Um, what I've done is I've made the course half price, um, and um, because um, I, I realise that people have got a lot of time for online learning just now, and um, but they're you know they're out of work or they've they've lost a lot of income or the future is very uncertain at the moment. So the course is usually two hundred and forty five euros if you buy it in full. So it's half price just now, which is one hundred and twenty two fifty. Or there's also a, a, an option to pay uh, just to subscribe a monthly subscription. So that's usually 20 euros a month, but at the moment it's 10. Um, so that gives you access to everything with the monthly membership. As long as you keep paying the monthly membership, when you cancel your subscription, um, you don't have access. You, you know, whatever documents you've downloaded, obviously you keep, but um, you don't have access to the videos and photos or the webinars anymore. You're welcome. Um, sorry, did somebody put, I thought I got a notification. It's so hard to uh, try my best to keep track of all the bits and pieces that are pinging in. Um, so just if you are interested in joining the course, um, I'll just pull this up again. Um, if you go to um, my website, then if you go to the homepage, I'll just need to sign out of this. Um, whoops. Um, so that I'm not logged in because it's going to show you that. Log out. Okay. So if you go to the home page of my website, then um, load the menus. You know, if you're on your mobile phone, load the menus. It's got loads of stuff on it and it's really hard to find, uh, to ne negotiate something with a lot of content if you don't load the menus. Um, Phones are designed for scrolling, not for <laughs> dealing with things with much content, I think. So if you go to the Learn menu and Online Courses, it's there. And then you're on this just now, a free informal introductory class. It's the next one down, Learn with the Seasons, Wild Food Foraging and Herbal Medicine video course. So just click that button there and um, that will bring up the the page with all the information about the course so the details of which plants are covered and which recipes are covered and all sorts of things so a lot of these photos are from the summer ones so honeysuckle st john's work calendula and um, there's the hazelnut and sorrel pesto there's the meadow sweet there's just loads um yeah there's there's absolutely loads in it uh sorry i can see somebody's typing something i'll try and bring up your comment it just takes a little while. Oh, there it is again. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, you just scroll down here and here's the enrollment options. So either the left-hand side is the buy it once, keep it forever thing. So that's where it's usually 245 euros. Uh, and that means you get access to the course, uh, you know, for as long as as long as um, lifetime access, they call it, but it's for as long as technology exists, I think, you know, <laughs> barring uh, a, a nuclear uh, holocaust, uh, 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 crop, what do they call it? Apocalypse, that's the word I was trying to get out, sorry. And then over on the other side is the monthly subscription. So just click whichever option you want. And uh, you don't need coupon codes or anything. I got rid of those and I just lowered the price on the website. So just fill out your details and um, check out. Now, it, the PayPal thing confuses people. PayPal is just a system for processing credit and credit cards and debit cards. You don't need a PayPal account to use it. It's just a secure method of processing cards to try and prevent fraud. Um, if you choose the monthly option, it will prompt you to save your details with PayPal because it needs to do that in order to charge you the 10 euros every month. But if you're buying it outright, it doesn't matter. And you'll, you'll just need to fill these details out and click that blue button and um, it will take you through to um, the PayPal checkout screen. And you just, there's an option that says pay by credit or debit card. Just select that. You don't need to have a PayPal account. It's really very straightforward. Um, thanks so much for being for your generosity and giving us so much of your time. So good of you. Oh, at these cocooning times. Yeah, we've had people on actually who had the virus and they were just saying it was really nice to do something like this. So yeah, you're very welcome, Anne. Hiya. Um, 
thanks, I can't wait to join the course. Oh, you're in the master. Yeah, there are there were, there were a good few people actually. I made that video course so that people who knew nothing about wild food or herbs or herbal medicine could start to learn it. But what fascinated me was that loads of qualified herbalists joined it because they weren't getting the medicine making skills, I think, in some of the, the courses they were um, training on, and also to learn about the wild food, because I know wild food's got very trendy now, but there wasn't a great deal, there, there, there wasn't as much of it back then. And um, so to learn about the medicinal herbs, but from a wild food perspective. And um, I, uh, yeah, so there are a lot of herbalists doing it actually. And then professional foraging teachers do it as well to learn about the medicine side. So yeah, I wasn't um, really expecting that. But yeah, there were quite a few people from that course doing it. Yeah, I could probably put you in touch with them. Um, oh, thanks, Bear. Another great session. Thanks a million. I'm so delighted I've signed up for your course. Once we finish, I'm on my way back to see what I can add to my lunch today. Oh, that's lovely. I've sent info to a few friends I think may also be interested. Well, thanks ever so much. That's lovely. Um, thank you. Best greetings from Lithuania. Oh, great. Jeez, you'll have loads of lovely foraging options there. Thank you for joining, joining us today. Do you have any questions to finish off, folks? Um, or are you okay? you off to um, have some sorrel, uh, sorrel in your salad for lunch and brew up some cleaver's deodorant. <laughs> Thank you, it really does help with my studies. Great, yeah, and um, the course is informal, so you just dip in and out of it. There isn't a test or an essay or anything, so um, I do plan to add an optional add-on um, extra. Um, it's just taking ages to do where people can take an optional test if they want to do it so that they can get some sort of credit for it, whether it's if you're a practitioner, whether it counts as CPD learning, or if you're a student, it counts towards your medicine making skills for your course or something, or foundation level skills. It's just actually what's taking the time is that all these different places have different standards about what they class for those things, and it just takes blooming ages to contact them all and hear back. <laughs> So I've been kind of doing that off and on actually since 2015, but I will um, crack on with it this year so that um, anyone who's done the course over the last um, five years can then opt to, it will just be by the, by the test and take it. So um, so yeah, I know that would be great. It just It's just taken ages. That's why I've not got it sorted yet. Um, Thanks so much. Look forward to joining the course. Well, thanks everybody. It's been lovely um, to have you here. And um, it's, uh, you know, I've run this for years and these free uh, intro classes for years, but obviously just now it's, it's different. And it seems to be um, focusing on something so practical, positive and rewarding uh, just now is really helping people. And even if all that happens from this is the first year, all you do is you start to notice some of the plants that are in the course and recognize them. You don't need to do everything. It's not pressure. It's not, um, you don't have a deadline. You're not trying to achieve something. Just do it gradually. Plants come back year after year. You don't need to do it all right away. And it's much better with this actually that you start to integrate it and do bits of it in your life gradually rather than try and intensively learn it, you know? Um, so it's that's why it's nice for people to dip in and out of. And what interests you this year, you might find five years later something completely different if you go back in and look at it again jumps out at you because it's more relevant to you at the stage of life that you're in that happens to me with the books you know i'll go back to books that i've had for 25 years and i'll go oh, i completely forgotten about that and it was just not relevant to what i was doing or the stage i was at 25 years ago but now it is you know so anyway there we are Need to go for a conference call for work. Yeah, I think we need to go. It's lunchtime, isn't it? So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Miriam. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Justine. Uh, thanks, other Susie. Thanks me to all the Marys who are here and all the Anne's and Anya's who have been on and several Lisa's and to Bernie and to Sue. There were two Sue's as well. Well done, Sue. You got on. That's brilliant. 
to Michelle, to Marge. Uh, delighted to have you all here, and Joyce, and Joan, and Frida, and Angela, um, Justine. I'm sorry if I missed if it's someone I can't see all the names. Oh, that's great, and I'll be signing up soon. Great. Well, it's all there, so um, whenever you're ready. Um, it, um, but obviously, if you're joining now, then the um, the student Q and A is on Wednesday evening, so that's next week. So thanks everyone for your time and I hope it inspires you wherever you live uh, to even just start to notice these things. You know, um, we're a big part of nature and uh, it's, not, it's not an ornament, it's not something to go and visit. It's when you realise that it's growing all around you, whether you live in the country or the city, that's when it transforms your life and your experience and, um, you know, we start to realise that we're part of nature and we can actually really choose to enhance it. So um, it's a lovely thing, really. Okay, thanks, Peter. All right, okay, so I'll send around the video um, when it takes a few hours to process it, and I'll send it around with um, the link to the, the article on the BMJ and the deodorant recipe book. Um, and the phacelia, oh yeah, the thing for the uh, bees, bee flowers, that's us. Okay, so thanks everyone for your interest today, um, really appreciate it and I'll talk to you soon. Bye! <laughs>